exact for physics, very, very expensive for computation time. So I can use a couple of sphere colliders maybe if I got something that's double sphered. Yes, and uh, let, let's say you have a big uh, you know, dinosaur. monster boss, dinosaur. Yeah, dinosaur. Or monster are great. boss in a game, you can take different colliders down the legs and arms, and you can use multiple colliders to kind of flesh out the collision zones on a character. So on this one here, let's do a box collider, and this one we have a rigid body on the other one. So I'm going to click play and come back to my scene. And you notice what happened here? This guy. It looks like it fell. It fell. And actually, it looks I like double, it's rotating and actually, hitting stuff. Uh huh. I made a minor. Let me double check something here because I think I made a minor boo boo. I added a double collide here. The cubes by default actually have a collider on them already. I added two on there. Not a huge deal. But that's why it was actually bouncing as it went down. If I remove that, so this is my rigid body. I'm going to remove that collider. Let's just get rid of it. Remove yeah, it. Yeah, completely. I love enabling and disabling the parts, though. It's uh, fantastic. And Holy cow, it went through the floor. <laughs> right through there. <laughs> I'm going to file a bug against you. <laughs> That's a, a common beginner mistake, too, because either your objects don't have a collider, or let's add a collider back onto this, add a box collider onto it, and, but I'm, I'm partially through my terrain. If you're already touching in the kind of the collision matrix, oh, like let's do, hold on, this is going to be problematic <laughs> here because of my... The collision system's a bit faster than your mouse it is. It is faster than me here. Let's try this guy here. Ah, see, it's acting funny now. <laughs> it's popping up. Anyway, so one of the common things that you'll find, you place like a carriage controller, which we'll talk about shortly, objects on here, and they pass right through. And that's typically because the collision zone is sitting just a little bit beneath the surface here. This is probably happening because of my raised uh, terrain here. So I just want you to understand the basic components here. Rigid body gives your object mass, and you can actually assign a greater mass here to your object. This helps when one object is hitting another object, who's going to win? Who's got the greater mass? That's what that affects. Elephant versus the balloon. That's right. <laughs> Use gravity is checked off uh, by default here. And you have other kind of more advanced options, like to be able to uh, tell Unity, hey, don't rotate my object when it falls. I want to keep that rotation. And that comes in handy quite a few times. We'll look at that when we look at the game further. So what I did here was just a rigid body and a, and a uh, collider. Now let's take this a little bit further here and talk about vectors. All right. Like I said to Matt on the last session, Vector from Despicable Me. Did you see that movie? I saw one of the Despicable Me's, but uh, I was more enticed with the minions. Minions. Love those guys. <laughs> <laughs> vectors. They're just values. They sound confusing, and in math, they could be confusing. Uh, in Unity, they can actually take the place of a bunch of different things. They can be used to uh, represent a rotation. They can be used to represent a direction. But in a nutshell, a vector is nothing more than a point, just two values. Uh, it's called x and y, but actually two values that by themselves have no meaning whatsoever. If you create a new vector, it's nothing more than essentially two points stored in an object. There's nothing special about it. A vector 3D object, which exists in Unity, just contains uh, three values, x, y, and z. And again, they're just numbers. The fact that it's called x, y, z means absolutely nothing. They could have called it q, h, and a. It's just they try to map it to what you're using as your coordinate system in Unity. Vectors can represent different things, directions, values, forces. They can represent a rotational value. They're just values. And they can be relative, too, which is something very important to understand in Unity. Uh, there's forward space, which if you were to hold up your left hand and you, we had x and y and z was depth, when you open your scene, you have these world coordinates. They're global. Uh, forward is essentially z everywhere. Uh, take a cube. Forward could be however the object is rotating. And you have the option of choosing one or the other in Unity. You can say, hey, in, in my world, I want to go Z. Or I want to go Z wherever my object is facing, which is actually forward. And so we'll look at a little brief example of that. Related to vectors, though, typically in Unity, you'll see in moving objects. And there's a bunch of different ways to move objects. In my uh, MSDN series this month, I had, I think, seven or eight different methods listed of moving an object inside of Unity. Uh, and there's questions like, well, which one do I use? And the answer is it kind of depends. Typically, you add a rigid body to an object, and you move that rigid body by setting its velocity. So the first code example here shows we're setting rigid body velocity to, what did I say vector was? Just hold some values, right? Yep. So here we're saying uh, 7 in the x, 0 in the y, and 0 in the z. In other words, move at 7 meters per second in x. Now, in the next one here, we're saying, 
Same thing, we're setting the velocity on an object, but this one looks a little bit different. Sounds a little bit more complicated. The top one goes in the world coordinate. So the top one where it says vector seven comma zero comma zero, that is in my global world space, how that object's moving. In the example at the bottom, we're doing, we're setting the velocity to transform dot transform direction. And that basically makes it local. So wherever that object is rotated, it's going to move forward in that direction. So one way of dealing with world, one way with dealing with local. And they both come into play in different cases. Yeah, that's a pretty cool trick. I hadn't actually been using that. I'd been doing all of my stuff off of uh, trying to translate it myself. So oh. <laughs> cute, cool little tip, even for me. So let's look at some essentials in Unity here. Uh, the way I want to kind of structure this, since we're going to look at a more advanced but still kind of basic game that we piece together, the zombie pumpkin slayers. What we're going to do is talk about uh, the basic components required for that. So input, movement, vectors, and collision. So let's go ahead and look at that demo. And I have another scene set up here called Cube Me. We don't need to save this one. <laughs> so what is in this scene? I have a terrain, which I created in the last one, which is simply create a 3D object terrain. It gives us just some base to work on. I have, uh, it looks like it's kind of a little bit uh, textured here. This is just a rock texture. This is actually a completely flat surface. Even though it might look like it's not flat, it's completely mm. flat. I have a few awesome cubes. And what I've done with these cubes is they have a box collider, which is there by default. I've added a rigid body to each of these cubes. And in the first session, I mentioned tag. It was simply a way to assign a text screen to an object here. I tag them as enemy cube. And we'll see why we do that in a second here. And then I have a cube with controller. So this is the special guy right here. This cube has its own component on there, a script. Let's look at what that script does. We have two code methods we're going to use here. We have update. Let's increase this font size just a little bit. There we go. So we have update. Now, in Unity, when you want to read input, there's an input system in Unity. So if you want to read however you're moving horizontally or vertically, you call input.getAxis with this name. And what does that name map to? So if each using a string here, horizontal, well, if we look over in Unity under our project settings, input. And there's a bunch of preset uh, definitions here. Horizontal, the name horizontal means we're looking at the left and right arrow or the A and the D key. Think of the common uh, keyboard gaming keys. A and D move you yeah. left and so right. So why do I want to go through this instead of using the uh, get key, input dot get key code? I like using an axis because axis you can map around. Uh, it's easy to, for me, conceptually represent horizontal and vertical. And then I have a whole input manager. I can easily swap them out and change them. Or if I want to assign to a joystick. So if got, I want to configure my own keys, it makes it a little easier? Yep, absolutely. You can just set them oh, right okay. in here. You've got your own custom key definitions. So I'm just going to read horizontal here. And this is going to be a value between negative 1 and positive 1. And when you hold the keys down, you will actually scale that object, those values. And uh, it kind of ramps it up pretty quickly. You can control how quick it ramps that value up. Let's just see what those values look like here. Let's run this. And I'm going to view my output here. Right now, it's 0. I'm not moving anything. Let me find that cube. Oh, you know what I did? I turned off my camera, turned that guy back on. All right, so I've got this cube right there. Input is currently 0. Now notice, as I press the D key, or the right arrow, either one, I can see that cube kind of pressing over a little bit. And these input values, they scale up and scale back down again. Unity is actually collapsing these debug messages <laughs> here. There we go, 0. So that's how we read our input. Now we can take that and we can map that to something. So we've got some value between negative 1 and 1. We can say, you know what, we want to move in our Z direction by some value, in other words, whatever we're reading from our input. So we press the keys, we get this horizontal value. It's a pretty small value, so we're just going to multiply it by some sort of speed. In this case, I use 10. It's an arbitrary number. You kind of find what works for your game. And that becomes our movement vector. Again, it's just a value. It's 0, 0, and yet 0 for x, 0 for y. And in z, we have some value. And we're going to set our rigid body's velocity to move in that direction. So that takes care of moving over. Next, because we have a collider on this object, we can actually hook new this method here, which is behind the scenes. Unity uses reflection to see if you have these methods defined in your class. And it calls on collision enter and passes you this collision object, which is based off of whatever you collided with. 
So I'm doing a little debug log. This dot name collided with whatever I've just collided with. Now, I said I was using a tag. And why am I using a tag? Because you can collide with tons of things in your game. Your cube can drop and collide with your terrain. Uh, it could collide with another cube. It could collide with all sorts of things. I only want to do something when I hit uh, an enemy cube. This kind of goes back to an earlier session when we were talking about prefabs, because the name, if we went off that, is possibly a clone, right? So if they're all tagged the same. Yes. So then... in other words, I could say if collision.gameobject.name, but that name can change. To David's point, if I'm using uh, other prefabs, we looked at prefabs in the first session, and I create one dynamically, which we use the instantiate call to do that with. If I create one dynamically, its name can change. It could have a parenthesis clone after its name. So we look for things by tag. And so I've tagged those cubes as enemy cube. If it's an enemy cube that my main cube collides with, I'm going to just destroy that enemy cube. Now, we're not destroying our collision object. Collision is a component. We have to pop up one level and destroy the root game object. This is something you'll see all the time. Since the game object is your root object, that's really what you want to destroy, and thereby destroying everything underneath it. So let's see what this looks like. We're going to run this guy. Move over to the side here, and Ooh. that cube disappears. You got that cube. I got that cube. Got that cube. Oh, yeah, I'm on a roll. <laughs> I got three cubes. I'm cubed. Yes. Ah. So now what do we want to do next? Notice I've got a little text here, increment score. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you always have to have scores in games. So we can easily create an integer value called score. And next, we're going to want to create some reference to text on the screen. Let me delete what I have here so I can show you from scratch. With, this is a Unity 4.6 beta right now, hopefully to be released shortly. You can get this beta on their website. This is everything I'm showing you today can be done with the free version. And I'm going to create, under the UI menu, text. Ooh, this is that long-awaited UI that everyone UI, initially for. called UGUI, now called UI. And uh, so we'll see if that's the final name. But UI is what it looks like it's going to be. I'll, people waited a long time for this because the old system was kind of painful to use. Now you can drag and drop objects. It's so much nicer. So I'm going to create some text here. And you can see it creates this canvas element here. If I double click on it, there it is. Now let's take this text. I'm going to go into my 2 by 3 mode here because it makes this a little bit easier to see. So you have to essentially drag that text within the bounds of that white square to make sure it's on the screen. Is yes. that what I'm gathering? We can see it over there on the side. So this represents my screen. And this can actually see how it grows and sizes. That canvas dynamically changes to whatever size, essentially, device that you're on. So what I'm going to do here is I've got a couple fonts in my project. And you can just go over to what we were talking about earlier, something like thefont.com. Find a free font oh, there, yeah. download it. I'm using one that Matt put into this project here, uh, Ghoulish. Let's bump this size up a little bit. Now, I can type in a new size, or it's a little discoverability thing in Unity where any number, you can actually click on the name, and it becomes a slider. There we go. I like yep. the Ghoulish. We'll call this uh, score zero. All right. Now I need some way to update the score when I do something. So let's go back to my code. And in my code here, I've got a score. Let's get a reference to that text box. And I can create it private, because I might not want it exposed to the world. And this is a text element, which by default is actually not there. You have to bring in. By default, it's not going to be found. So if I right click on it, I can just resolve the reference. It exists in this namespace, UnityEngine.ui. It's one of the nice things about using uh, Visual Studio. Oh, I love it. So we have this element right here. Now, this is just a private variable. How do we set it? Well, we can search for it when this game object starts up. But I'm going to use one of my favorite features of Unity, and I'm going to display this field in the editor. If I make it public, it will automatically show up in the editor. But then it's public that other classes can read that value. I don't want that. I want this still private, but I want to expose it in the editor. So I'm going to add the serialized field attribute to it. And simply by doing that, if I go back to Unity, and I look at my cube with controller. What we'll find here, notice. Oh, there it is. I've got that text box there. It's not assigned, so I will just drag this on over. Voila. It's assigned. And now in my code, after I do my collision and destroy, I can say, hey, I want to update my text. It's a text box which, with a text property. 
to. Now you could use string.format here, which I would typically do, but just to save a second or two here, I'm just going to say underscore.